Hi, I'm Tommy Thompson and welcome back for part 3 of the AI of Sea of Thieves here on AI and Games. In parts 1 and 2, I looked at how Rare's online pirate game balances the AI systems at play across each server, plus how Skeleton and Shark AI are built to keep players on their toes both on land and in the water. In this penultimate video, we look at the three biggest threats players face across the Sea of Thieves. Megan, Karen and Skelly? Or is it, or is it Skeven? it seems to be open to debate. All of the AI we've seen to date in this case study is built to facilitate a specific design element. The pigs, snakes and chickens bring life to the tropical islands, the skeletons present a threat that seeks to thwart your quest for hidden treasure, whilst the sharks seek to keep you from sitting too long in the water. While other crews of players present a threat as you sail the Sea of Thieves, Rare sought to add even greater threats that could sink even the strongest of galleons. At launch, players could fall prey to the Kraken as it hunted ships on the open seas. Meanwhile, the Hungering Deep expansion introduced the mighty Megalodon, plus the Cursed Sails event brought haunted galleons commanded by skeletons to open waters. Each of these act as larger event battles on the sea that have varying conditions that enable their activation. The Kraken has always been haunting the open seas ready to attack ships, whilst the Megalodon originally could only be summoned having completed Merrick's questline and travelling just south of the Devil's Ridge. Similarly, the haunted galleons which first appeared during the Cursed Sails event were constrained to three specific sites near Smuggler's Bay, Sharkbait Cove and Marauder's Arch. However, since those expansions, both the Megalodon and the skeleton ships have expanded the remit, spawning in the open world and attacking players in a more dynamic fashion more akin to how the Kraken operates. As such, this has seen each of these experiences add new features, such as varying Megalodon personalities and now two sizes of skeleton ships. As these changes were being made, it leads to new constraints that need to be managed within the core gameplay systems. Do you allow these systems to interact with each other? Can you be attacking a skeleton ship only for a Megalodon to interrupt? Does a Kraken or Megalodon attack skeleton ships as well as players? As Sarah Noonan explained, at one point there was a concern about having more than one of these systems in play at once for a given crew, however upon experiencing it themselves when testing internally, the opinion of the team shifted pretty quickly. Yeah, well, I remember we had a task up on the board to stop Megan spawning when we had the Kraken up, because yes. we didn't know what would happen, but then it just happened once in a playtest and someone just took that ticket off the board, we were like, mm. no, we need, like, now we need to spend time making sure that this encounter is good, because it was just those layers that we hadn't expected to happen together just emerged in a playtest once and it was like, okay, yeah, we definitely need this in the game. Yeah, essentially anything that's like twitchable, anything that we, you know, oh, this will be a gift, and then, you know, and then that's it. And, then, and again, we, we have to leave those things in. As a result, there has been a more concerted effort in recent updates to ensure that these interactions continue to prove interesting and fun, whilst also enabling them to interact with one another, all the while keeping all those AI overheads discussed in part one to a minimum. During my visit to Rare, I had the chance to sit down and chat with three developers whose work had proven critical to the release of each of these features. Andy Bastable, who discussed his work on the Shark AI in Part 2, was largely responsible for the development of the Megalodon, while Chantelle Porritt and Tristan Bell had a big hand in the ongoing development of the Kraken and Skeleton ships respectively. But during my interview on Skeleton AI with Rob and Sarah from back in Part 2, I quickly discovered that each of these systems goes by slightly different names internally. Yeah. I remember, I always remember when we were working on uh, Megan on the Megalodon. Yeah, sorry. We had, we had we, we, we've got nicknames for her things, so <laughs> you should probably explain that first. Megan, yeah, Megan and Karen. Um, so Karen is the <laughs> Kraken. <laughs> so while the Kraken and Megalodon became Karen and Megan respectively, it seems like there was some disagreement on the skeleton ships. What was the name for the skeleton ship that oh, never that really Skeven. took off? That was terrible. And the skeleton ship, did we settle on Skeven? Yeah, well, <laughs> I settled on Skeven. Yeah, so, so Andy, Andy has, I think, named them all, and he came over and he was like, so we've got Kelly, no, it was Karen, and we've got Meg. We need probably like a boy's name for the skeleton ship just to break the mold. And like, what should we do? It's like, Skeven. <laughs> <laughs> But later talking about it with Andy, it seems there was some method behind the madness of the naming conventions. I thought it was quite good. So our thinking of it was all of our kind of creatures were named after women. So we had Karen the Kraken and we had Megan the Megalodon. And ships were traditionally named after women, like they're, they're traditionally kind of like you refer to them as she and her. And so we thought, oh, we should flip the gender <laughs> like we've like we've done with our creatures. We should we should do the same with the um, 
with the ships and so we thought that's where we thought oh it'd be good to give them a male name and then it was like well what male name starts with sk and that was where skevin came from but hey i know you're here to listen about the ai of these enemies so let's do just that let's look at each of these threats in turn the basics of how they work, the tweaks and updates made since launch, how each of them fit within the existing AI management systems discussed in part 1, and the fun tricks required to have the skeletons run around and take command of the haunted ships. Let's begin with the easiest one to explain. Megan the Megalodon, or as she was called during development, Tidy Shark. It was a code name that sought to keep the developers' intentions hidden from data miners, always spying for the next update. She's arguably the easiest AI to explain because, well, I already did much of the legwork in part two, given that the Megalodon is, for all intents and purposes, a larger version of the original Shark AI, only she now attacks ships instead of players. Um, the Megalodon basically came out of a conversation where I came in one day and my producer Drew basically said, Andy, how, how quickly can you scale up a shark? Um, and and that, was when I, that was when I knew that like my, work, my week was going to get a bit more interesting. Um, and obviously the Megalodon is more than a scaled up shark, but that's effectively where it started. It, first of all, we started by going, if we were to take the standard shark stuff we've got, and just scale it up. Does the pathing still work for a start? Does the animation still work? Then can we put a model in that makes it look more aggressive and scary at that scale? Because obviously a, the standard shark at that scale doesn't necessarily look as, as kind of scary. And then after that, it was like, okay, we knew that we had that working. So we had the technical side of that kind of sorted and we had to make a few adjustments here and there, but by and large, it just kind of like works. However, it's not as straightforward as just big shark. Megan's behaviour is rebalanced to better fit the pacing of naval combat. Yeah, well, we had it set up differently because um, it's different from the Hunger and Deep to the actual when it, when she's in the world. Because um, I think the Hunger and Deep, we had it where she will just spawn in a specific um, position and like rise up out of it. And yes. Angry raw. Um, but then when she's released in the world now and she's just there, she will kind of just appear and then she will just come up and it, it, I think it completely depends where you are as to where she will appear, but she will generally like attack you from the side and come round and get you, but otherwise she will, she can just appear, or if she's feeling dramatic she will just do the big roar and draw, jump out of the, the, the sea as well and come get ya. A set of gameplay timers are used to balance the frequency of her behaviour set. This includes popping out of the water to swim alongside your ship, swim under the boat, and of course attacking and taking a big chunk out of the hull. While she presents a big enough target to shoot at for the most part, there's still a need to ensure players can take her down and not feel like the experience is unbalanced. This not only resulted in custom visual effects being employed such that the fin and top of the Megalodon are better visible when on the surface, but the existing shark navigation systems discussed back in part 2 are employed to ensure that Megan is often positioned such that she is within cannon range. We make a decision about whether the Megalodon, when it comes in for a bite, is going to come in cannon side, i.e. you can hit it with a cannon, or front and back of the ship, where you definitely can't hit it with the cannon. But what we don't do is we don't allow it to come in at an angle where you feel like you could hit it with the cannons, but you can't, because it's in that funny zone where your cannons don't quite twist enough. Yeah. So in order to get, in order to, um, to, for the player to not feel frustrated, we don't allow it to approach in those ways. You either know you definitely can't hit it, or you know you've got a decent shot at hitting it, and we stop it from attacking in those grey areas. Megan can spawn in to attack a crew once her cooldown timer has ended, after which point any crews that are out on the open waters can potentially suffer her wrath. However, despite this, there's actually a good chance Megan will pop up just to mess with you. The updates since The Hungering Deep have added a lot of variety to the Megalodon's look and behaviour, with different skins, as well as the chance she can spawn in a passive mode, whereby she'll only attack you when provoked. There are random chances depending on whether she will be aggressive when she spawns or whether she is just passive. And then I think um, depending on um, if you go after her, she will become aggressive. Okay. So if, if you antagonise, if you start shooting her, she's going to get her it. She's going to come after you as yeah. well. Depending on how much damage she takes, yes. um, she will eventually turn on you and become aggressive. Next up, let's deal with the boss monster released at launch, Karen the Kraken. The Kraken periodically opts to attack a particular ship somewhere in the open world. 
Upon triggering the attack, the seas nearby turn black and several tentacles rise from the depths. Each time the Kraken spawns in, the tentacles surround the ship. And yeah, it's just tentacles. As many players have suspected since the beginning, Karen doesn't actually have a body. Her tentacles are a mixture of those that are actually going to attack players and the ship, as well as those that are merely set dressing and are designed to add some scope to the proceedings. Karen is unique in that she's the only AI character in the entire game that isn't reliant on the behaviour tree architecture in Unreal Engine 4. Each tentacle is its own unique AI component, which can either attack a player, attack their ship, or simply sit in the water and not engage. However, the tentacles are built such that they all receive instructions from a system known as Overlord, which dictates which tentacles should be active and selects the valid targets. The Overlord is built more or less as a finite state machine, and its job is to keep an eye on the time between attacks, whether a tentacle is attacking the ship or players, and the types of attacks currently being employed. Much like Megan, Karen's tentacles are deliberately spawned in such a way to ensure that you can defeat them, with them deliberately positioned around the ship such that they are within cannon and pistol firing range. Plus, each player in a given crew that is going to be attacked by Karen has their own corresponding cooldown timer. When that player is attacked by one of Karen's tentacles, the cooldown timer is reset so that, you know, for a period at least, you'll get a breather and either recover or start attacking once more. Plus, more critically, this distributes the damage being delivered across all the crew in the ship. Hence, with a bit of coordination and even a little bit of luck, you can send Karen back to the depths of the ocean. Every time Karen attacks a ship on the server, she'll wait a certain amount of time before doing so again. Hence, there's a chance for all crews to go about their business for a short while before they're attacked again. While the time between attacks is still a secret, the Kraken's attack cooldowns, like the Megalodons, has changed and received tweaks throughout the first year of the game's development. However, one interesting thing I did learn was that she doesn't discriminate and will happily attack any crew that is out in the open waters, even if it's a crew she's already attacked in the same play session. So while you might be safe for a time whilst attacking a skeleton fort on land, you better be quick about dropping all that loot off at the nearest outpost. So good. I, I yeah. remember. I, I think was it. I think it was one of the play tests here where we were testing forts, and someone betrayed us. And so we, we worked together. We got all, all the treasure, and then they they killed us all, and then took the treasure. And then when we came back, we saw them sailing away, and then get attacked by the kraken. We're like, ah. <laughs> yeah. Last but not least, let's look at the skeleton ships. As recently as the Shrouded Spoils, skeleton galleons can now appear on the open waters and proceed to attack players if they get a little too close. Each ship has its own crew of individual AI skeletons, and there's an interesting combination of real-time AI behaviours being deployed, with smoke and mirrors to streamline the overall process for the developers whilst attaining the desired effect. It's actually the most complicated set of AI systems in the entire game, and took months to come together from original concept all the way to finished product. The ships themselves are reliant on their own unique sailing and steering mechanisms. Given much like the issues had with the Shark AI, there's no navigation systems built in UE4 to handle ships atop water. So each skeleton ship has its own collection of sensors not only for detecting nearby obstacles, but calculating where both it and nearby ships, be they human or AI controlled, are going to be a couple of seconds from now. This helps anticipate collisions with nearby islands, rock outcrops, and even other ships. Unless, of course, it wants to ram you, and it allows the steering AI to move the ship accordingly. This projection is also applied to the ships rising out of the ocean, so that they don't land atop another ship like their evil Knievel. The actual movement speed is being calculated based on the potential it can achieve based on wind direction and adjusted accordingly. Now, if you consider the makeup of a haunted ship, it has numerous skeletons running around the deck. Each of these are reliant on the skeleton AI framework as detailed in part 2 where they interface with a virtual representation of the player's input to do the same things we can. However, there are some limitations. They can man the cannons and repair damage using the planks in their inventory, but they can't bail water, which has led to some creative solutions for defeating them by players. But it does employ some smoke and mirrors to sell the effect of a skeleton crew manning a ship. The anchor and sails aren't controlled by the skeletons. The ship itself corrects their position. Plus, having explained all of the navigation systems a minute ago, this actually removes the need for a skeleton to try and calculate the navigation itself. But despite that, 
the ship can't steer lest this fella right here is at the helm, the captain. So yeah, while the captain has to be at the helm in order for the boat to sail, the ship is sailing itself. So um, what happens if the captain's on the wheel, then everything's fine if he comes off, so you can use around him to sort of stop that from happening. But if you aggro him off, then it kind of breaks the tracking and um, he sails off. And then if he survives or he kills you or you leave, then he'll go back onto the wheel. And then so, so only the captain skeleton mm -hmm. can captain the ship. However, despite how cool all this is, the real success that has been achieved in the skeleton ship AI is one that most players would never think twice about. The skeletons on the ships are actually moving around both on the deck and in the hull. They're capable of moving to holes in the hull to repair them, as well as head for the cannons to fire them. Now, this is something that for most players isn't all that groundbreaking, but from an AI perspective, this is actually a really big deal and the one thing upon playing Sea of Thieves that really took me by surprise. Let me explain. As I discussed back in part 2, we typically use a system called a navigation mesh for characters to walk across 3D environments, and in fact, all the skeletons on the islands are using the nav mesh system to move around. However, navigation meshes are typically built or baked into the level in advance, or, like in my recent case study in Horizon Zero Dawn, calculated at runtime based on changes by rocks or other small items being moved around on the surface of the nav mesh. So yes, they can adapt to changes in objects and characters being moved around on the nav mesh itself, but the navigation mesh itself doesn't move. If the surface itself was moving, it would have to recalculate not just the nav mesh, but also the paths of all characters standing on it every time it moves by even the smallest amount. That's simply far too much CPU and memory resources to consume. It's a massive bottleneck. But here in Sea of Thieves, the surfaces of the hull and deck aren't just moving in line with the waves of the ocean always moving, but they're on a moving ship. At first I thought it's faked that the skeletons simply move from one point on the ship to the other. But if you look at how they move on galleons, they're running around as they wish, all the while adhering to the topography of standing on a moving ship with respect to the physics of the ocean. How did they do it? The big secret is that the navigation mesh for the ships isn't actually moving, it's baked deep into the ocean. The navigation mesh for the entire ship is baked deep down on the ocean floor, and each skeleton is plotting their movement on that nav mesh. This nav mesh doesn't move with the ship and it stays at a fixed point. Meanwhile, each coordinate on the navigation mesh is translated from the ocean floor onto the ship's deck and hull respectively. This has to factor the current orientation of the ship with regards to the ocean's surface, meaning the navigation paths need to follow the actual rotation of the ship as it crashes through a wave. It's a really creative solution to an otherwise horrendously complicated problem, and whilst not perfect, it achieves what the team wanted really, really well. While players present a real threat to one another as you sail the Sea of Thieves, the AI characters are still pulling their weight. Throughout the past three videos, we've covered all of the AI systems that are running under the hood during your Sea of Thieves experience. Crafting missions for you, spawning a variety of friendly and aggressive AI characters on both land and at sea, and balancing that overall experience for players across the server. But despite all that, I'm not done yet. A game like Sea of Thieves takes a lot of dedication from the entire development team at Rare, from artists and animators to sound designers and programmers, and it can prove challenging to steer a project of this size. So in my closing entry on the AI of Sea of Thieves, we're going to look at testing and deployment systems used throughout the game's development and how it's streamlined working practices. I'll be chatting with Andy and Rob, two of the leads in the project that were responsible for steering this new direction on the Sea of Thieves codebase how a testing system helps prevent bugs with AI and other gameplay systems from reaching players, and how automated builds enabled for continued rapid development of the game long before it ever appeared on the Xbox Marketplace. Stick around for this one, folks. It's going to be something special.